development plans, and they were just going to pack up and leave town. Well, can't do that. It's a, it's a public water system. And so what happened is that for several years, it went through back and forth through us and the PUC to up their rates so they could survive. Uh, finally, in 2011, uh, four years later, there was a permanent rate increase. And so then we said, okay, now time to relook at your application. Um, and just as a schematic, this isn't as complicated, but the, the well we're talking about is in the middle of this Kuala Pu Aquifer Sustainable Yield is five. Um, these three wells from all and uh, from all their applications, and there's also a DHHL reservation in this area, they probably will exceed that sustainable yield. So what we've asked is that all of them update their applications because some of them are pending for future uses. And so and what we're going to do is bring them all back into a contested case mode. Um, we don't have uh, authority to delegate to the chairperson the higher hearings officer on this right now, but that's where we're headed. Uh, last one, uh, Kauai. Last time, one minute. I'll try to go through Kauai real quick. Uh, what they're trying to do is uh, drill a horizontal well uh, to gain access to the dike waters. And it would probably be um, artesian, so that they would, well, what they're trying to do is get artesian flow so that they don't have to use these wells any, any longer, save on energy. The water will um, be pretty, there should be pretty good water quality, and it'll flow, save money. It's going to be about $25 million to do. It's on the Kapa'a side of the island, but they haven't really selected a site where they would begin this drilling. Obviously, there are a lot of concerns because dikes do intersect um, uh, surface water. There may be a permanent loss of high-level stored water like we saw uh, in Waiholi on this island. Um, uh, we're concerned about water wastage where water may leak if it's not properly constructed. We don't have really uh, standards for this like we do other wells. Um, and we don't even know how to test how, how will this change uh, the flows uh, in the streams and so forth in the area. Uh, so what we're looking at is they obviously they got to come in for a construction permit, which we're not really sure. This is an animal we haven't seen before. Um, but stream channel alteration permits and I. IFS in-stream flow standards amendments because they may impact surface water. And so um, we're monitoring their EIS very closely here. And last but not least is uh, Waimea River. Recently in July, uh, Earth Justice in, uh, on behalf of Kauai, Maiola, uh, this West Kauai Watershed Alliance, uh, out in this area, uh, uh, sugar is no longer in existence, but the infrastructure remains common theme, uh, but the water's still being diverted, wasted, and people want it restored, you know, back to the public trust things, TNC, permanent rights, that kind of thing. So that's what we're dealing with right now, it's in its infant stages. Um, and really, like I was mentioning earlier, all the red are surface water related. The only one that is really groundwater is Kukui Molokai. In the past, there would have been more blue. So things are changing at the commission where there's really more surface water interest in things. Um, and I think that's will continue in the near future. Um, and that's all I have. That's our website. We have this and more is on the website. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. But the public trust doctrine is applied to Hawaii, applies to both surface and groundwater. Yes. Um, with the uh, East Maui streams in Maui, uh, um, have they uh, have the water companies, whether the water, have they started to make sure to make the structural changes to ensure that minimum flow? Or uh, yes, they have, um, and for the most part, they've met them, with the exception in Maui Inha, where there was a stay of one of the uh, the requirements to restore, because what happened was they restored some, they, they restored more water. Well, well, they met the commission's decision, but there wasn't enough water that was reaching some of the people in that schematic, so they were affected. So they were up in arms, mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly, they were going after, I guess, the, the Earth Justice people who were encouraging them to apply for, for you know, all of this. And 
they were pretty hoo hoo at that. Mm -hmm. So the commission, uh, we, there was a stay of that for now, so that water can continue to go. Um, but again, it's on remand anyway because we, because the commission has to identify more appropriate rights. Mm -hmm. Is there any stream in that area now where they're still taking 100% of the water at the diversion? Uh, the other ones, the, uh, the, the ones that, yeah, you know, continue, yeah. They plan on giving them any? Only the, well, the contested case stream can, you know, one can tell. Things change. Okay, all right, thanks. Sorry. What's the difference between this horizontal drilling that you mentioned here? And the old Maui style, Maui type wells. The Maui type, the ones yeah. where they drill down and then they drill into. Yeah. Um, so. Well, well, the Maui type are underground, I guess. <laughs> They're a shaft and then they drill and then you do yeah, horizontally. And horizontally. Um, and, but they never got enough partition to get to the surface. This one, it'll be at the surface at a higher look than uh, So it's just a matter of yeah, yeah, I see. Okay. ground, underground, above ground. Thank you.
while these uh, did not impact human health, uh, we have addressed these and um, um, hopefully we can, can move on and, and minimize these types of mistakes. But you have to understand that our labs, our chemistry lab, um, they analyze 6,000, they do 6,000 tests uh, per year. So uh, uh, there's always that the human nature that factor that, that enters into this. This is something that you've really heard a lot about. Um, <laughs> all of the customer service issues, and I just lumped it together here. Um, you can kind of see why Ernest is not here. This is, this is, <laughs> this is part of his problem that he's dealing with. And believe me, it's a, it's a headache. Um, this, is, this is what I describe as a perfect storm. Because not only did we switch onto our CNC, CCMB, which is our new customer care and billing system, uh, to replace the antiquated system, but you had the, uh, the switch from bi-monthly to monthly. You had the you had the rate increases going on. You had the monthly service fee, which uh, customers were definitely not happy about. Um, and so all of this put a lot of pressure on our customer service uh, division. And in trying to address that, uh, we've done some temporary hires to try to to um, reduce some of the call waiting time and to answer questions also to do some of the pre-audit so that we can do some checks on the, the, um, the, you know, the billing before it gets uh, sent out. Right now, if there, if there is no audit done on any of the, the billing, billings, then after four days, it automatically goes into an estimated bill uh, mode in our system. And so we're trying to counter that. Um, you may have also heard about the Baratania property redevelopment. And this is actually you know, what we did as a as sort of a compromise to council last year to drop their their um, their plan to put us into the executive branch, um, and we we um, we requested proposals for the development. I think it was this past March, and uh, that's still ongoing. But this is a way for us to increase our um, lease revenue stream to the. Uh, to maximizing the, the utility of our Baratania property, which is six acres. Uh, Nuoto Reservoir 4, um, oh boy. You know, we're not in the, the flood control business, but yet yeah, this is our baby. And we're gonna be doing repairs there to keep the stage levels at the reservoir as low as possible. Right now they're about 29 feet. We intend to drop them down to as low as say 12 feet. And that really will minimize, significantly minimize the potential of this high hazard dam. Um, now, getting away from the, the management uh, lens and going to the hydrology lens, uh, these are some of our uh, resource sustainability uh, strategies. Currently, we're working on three watershed management plans. Three have been completed already, Kola Loa, Kola Poco, and Wainai. Um, after the three that you see up there are completed, we have just two left, and that'll be East Honolulu and uh, the primary urban core. Uh, those are expected to really be um, intense documents because the, it's a very dense area, and as you can imagine, a lot of uh, a lot of the climate uh, adaptation questions will come up at that time. <coughs> um, we uh, we're on we're on several of, a couple of these watershed partnerships: the uh, Kola Mountains and the uh, Wainai Mountains water uh, watershed partnerships. Uh, this is actively uh, this is an active process with us. Um, and we also participate with other partnerships such as the Wahe Aupua Initiative at the uh, OISC um, group. Uh, Wahe is, is interesting um, in that uh, recently we put in a fish ladder on that stream. This allowed the Oopu to get upstream. And in the, the most recent survey, they did find species up there, so that was a really good sign that the fish ladder that we put in was a worthwhile endeavor. And then of course, we put out a watershed priority uh, plan, and you'll be seeing that on our website shortly uh, in poster form. And currently, we're working on a strategic plan to frame all of that. Our water conservation, um, we see a decreasing demand rate over time. And in recent years, it's, it's, the rate is down to, say, 0.6 million gallons per day. 
um, up from say what it was at about 1.6 million gallons per day in the 80s and 90s. So um, what this is doing is this is kind of pushing back the time frame for our desal um, initiatives. Um, we're also doing things like Quincy, which is the Quality Infrastructure Conservation Initiative audits. It, it, every time there's a, a main break, we audit we audit the pipe to see what went off the soil, um, to see what the root cause of the break was. And Quincy is that, that project. Um, our internal leak detection program within the department uh, is a crew of um, field, um, field operations workers and inspectors. Um, and since its inception, they've been, uh, they found leaks that they've repaired to the amount of 1.4 million gallons per day. So it's a, a very good program. And the others, um, I think you're all familiar with some of the other programs because our, um, we try to be very uh, out there in our outreach programs. Um, we still have some tours if you're interested in them at the uh, Waiye Tunnel, Fred Art, um, Nuono Reservoir. We don't have Halawa Shaft uh, back online yet uh, as, as far as the uh, elevator for that facility. So that, that tour is not being offered. And then, of course, uh, the other thing is our diversified water supplies. If we can push back or, or replace the use of potable uh, water with some other source, then that extends our um, time horizon for going into desal. And so in order to do that, we've, we've gone into these um, strategies. One is recyc recycled water. Where we're currently using um, or producing, uh, let's see, 10 million, 10 million gallons of R1 2 million gallons of uh, RO water. Uh, brackish water and non-portable, I think you're familiar with Smita Farms, the use of spring discharge for irrigation along the um, airport area. And of course, desalination. We have a couple of sites in Kapolei, but the horizon for desal at this time is probably 2025, 2030. Now these are the strategies that we use to, to monitor our resource. And I'll just go through them very quickly. Um, we monitor our water quality through uh, the chemistry lab and the microbial, uh, microbiological lab. Um, we have 14 index monitor wells that we use to track the uh, condition of our aquifer head levels. Each one of these wells is representative of the aquifer in which they are in. Um, we have 10 rain gauge stations that we service. Um, we service a combination of what we call mountain and residential, so the, the uh, mountain intake areas as well as the, the residential area to look at what, the, uh, uh, what might be driving increased consumer demand for water. Uh, Demonitor wells, we have 27 of those. These are wells that go through the freshwater lens, through water of seawater quality. Uh, we do CTD profiles on these wells on a quarterly basis. Uh, monitoring a few of the points there. They're giving us very valuable information on the, uh, the, the condition of our aquifers. And of course, we rely on um, some of these other uh, entities, the U.S. Jobs Monitor, the National Weather Service. Uh, Steve, the USGS current stream flow conditions, uh, very important to us to see what the surface sources are, are doing. Because this is your, your earliest uh, form of warning. And along the same line, uh, same line, the one mile irrigation system to see what's happening with the Monowili ditch system because it's a surface diversion source as well as uh, they have water tunnel as well. So we like to know what's going on there. And, um, we've been we've been um, sponsoring for many years the USGS cooperative monitoring uh, program. And this is where USGS is for us. And this is something that we, uh, we are not going to give up because uh, uh, this kind of data is just too important. And for most of our streams, it's, uh, the gauging stations are on the windward side. So since there is such a close interaction between what goes on with the dike system <coughs> and the, um, the, the valley intersections, uh, uh, it's very important to know how the streams are, are performing. Um, when, it, when we're looking into climate adaptation resources, this is a whole slew of, of, of people that we can, or entities that we can uh, tap into and we have in the past. Uh, we participate in some of these uh, 
these groups like ORMP. Um, Pacific RISA, in particular, a few years back, they came up with a toolkit, and this is this allowed us to do uh, to do a uh, a draft of how we might integrate uh, climate change adaptation from the what I call the think tank uh, Pacific RISA to the institution, and this is a this is a very good toolkit. And this is some of the current research that's being done or being funded by the Board of Water Supply. TCB study, we're looking at um, uh, a study of our uh, GAC plants. And that's because if the DOH decides to lower their MCL on TCP, then it's uh, something we need to, to understand fully and to look at what the impacts would be as far as cost uh, as, a, as a result of that. The one on um, Himalayan blackberry and uh, myconia is, uh, we just completed the MOA on that, so that should be going out shortly. Uh, USGS is doing the uh, numerical model of Pearl Harbor for us, um, and we're in the final year of that, I believe. And uh, let's see, Professor Pao Shin Chu of the Department of Meteorology is doing a dynamic downscaling study for us using the CMIP-5 um, uh, global climate model. Uh, and we're very excited about that. He's in the uh, first year of a three years uh, study for that. Um, research project 2013-H1415B uh, is something that I'm working with Dr. al Qadi on, and, this, and we're looking at the relationship between rainfall, uh, Waihole water tunnels, and the response of Pearl Harbor index wells. And this will be very crucial for um, water managers in understanding what are some of the um, telltale signs of, um, that we can expect when we're seeing some, some uh, certain meteorological conditions out there. We're going to be looking at what happened in previous drought episodes. So this, is, this will be very important to the Board of Water Supply. Uh, future UH research. Um, we have uh, several on tap that um, I'm considering, and we're hoping to, to get that going, maybe for funding in 2015, but uh, there'll be a lot more in the future because um, we want to tap into the academia and, and, and allow them to, to um, work with us so that you have a good reconcil uh, reconciling of the academia and the institutional knowledge. Um, and I think that is beneficial to um, water managers. And finally, collaborative uh, research with other agencies. We will try to work with, say, the USGS, DOH, um, on certain projects and see where I'm And we think if we can do it in that fashion, uh, it'll be a much, uh, much more robust product that we come out with because you have all of these uh, agencies that are stakeholders in, in the process. Um, and with that, I'll... Uh, Big question? <laughs> Remember, I'm just a messenger. I'm not the other manager. Oh, my bill. <laughs> oh, my bill. Pardon me. Yes. Was the decline in demand, is it due to uh, the loss of sugar, and has it continued over the last 10 years, or did it sort of... The loss of demand is, is, is a very tricky uh, problem because it could, be, it could be due to one of many different covariates. Uh, uh, part of what we do is, is part of the equation, but um, it can be due to the economy, it can be due to conservation measures, um, say the equipment that's out there. So there are many factors in that. And it's difficult to say which one is contributing to the, um, the particular decline in demand. It may be something that you need to do a, a factor analysis on to look at the groupings to see what could be contributing to the, um, the decline. Gwen, can you remind us what that, that uh, decrease in demand was, the numbers again? Um, from oh, most currently, in the, the last 15 years, 0.6 million gallons per day, and what? prior to that, 1.6. That, that's a per capita? Or uh, or per no, that's day. our production. That's your production? Is production. only, only 1.6? That's the, that's the, the, the growth. Well, that's the, the that's growth. That's growth, yeah. Oh, so the yeah. rate of growth is So the rate of growth. It has been growing at 1.6 million gallons oh, per see. day, oh. and now it's 0.6. I see. So it's still increasing. Demand is still increasing. It's still increasing, slower, right? yes. Okay. 
Yeah, but this is just from the Board of Water Supply system. Just the Board of Water Supply, so we're not looking at military sources or the smaller private sources. Military or the Yes. Will your uh, water master plan um, take in for the economic considerations? Like, have you guys had an energy audit done? And, um, you know, looking at how to conserve energy. Yeah, the, the water master plan is going to look at um, everything, in, including the, the rates that, that are, are needed to, to support some of the CIP projects. Um, it's going to look at staffing need, needed to to, uh, to run some of those projects as well. Um, I guess I'm getting this. Are, are you guys are you subsidized? And then what is the real price of water? Are we even paying the real price? No, uh, we're not subsidized. All of our income, all of our revenue comes from the sale of water to our, uh, to our repairs. That's how we derive our income. Yes? I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> supply cost. Can you give us uh, a rough split of the total cost? How much money used for, say, energy, used for pumping? How, ma how much money used for the system maintenance. Yeah. Well, so that's maybe the two, the biggest expenses. Yeah, actually the, the biggest expense for us is, is not the capital uh, improvement project uh, component, but it's the ONM um, component of our organization. All the, um, what, it, what it takes to run the organization, the personnel costs, uh, or what have you. Um, I, don't, I don't recall exactly what the breakdown is. I can just tell you that the OM, ONM costs are much higher, the percentage is much higher than the um, CIP costs. How much electricity bill uh, you pay? What's the electricity bill you pay every month? That is in the, in the millions. And the way we're, I didn't put it on the slide, but the way we're addressing that is we've just gone on with the, um, the request to, uh, to get from vendors uh, proposals to do an energy audit or study of our facilities and we're hoping to reduce our energy consumption by 20 percent. Do you consider possible renewable energy usage for pumping? Yes, that, that is also that. A, a possibility. I can also tell you that before we get to the stage of desal, um, we'll, we will look at all options out there, uh, including the, you know looking at what the value of water is, definitely. How do you calculate the timeline of desal? Uh, it's based on um, um, estimated population demand. And what's causing the need for DSA? Um Well, as, as we get uh, closer to what the sustainable targets are set by sea worm, um, and we're seeing it reflected in, in some of our sources as well, then that'll, that'll start to drive um, the, the desal programming. Uh, what you can expect is as we're getting closer to, to the range of what DSA, um, you know, sustainable yield is, you're going to hear a lot more about water quality concerns and what have you. And that's a sign that you're getting very close to what that sustainable range is. And so um, um, you shouldn't be surprised when we get to that point. So it's driven totally by groundwater considerations right now? And you're not factoring in any rainfall issue? Um, as part of that, the rainfall study, we're very interested to see what the, the future projection will be for um, rainfall and how that will impact recharge. Um, yeah, we're very uh, interested in seeing the results from that study. Okay. Sorry. I was just going to make a quick thing too because as, you know, as, even as, as early as this fall we might be seeing the 2012 UPC plumbing codes come into play which would, which would you know, totally change what a pot of water demand might look like. It might actually Basically, what it allows non puddle water resources back inside the building for toilet flushing, cooling tower use, etc. Um, you know, so it'd, it'd be interesting to throw in those numbers in your mix as well, because obviously plumbing codes and regulations are going to change over the next 10, 20 years, and whether or not these saw will be. Yeah, and that, that's a very good point. The other thing I, I want to can mention is that the, the rate studies are done every five years, so because of the the outcry on, on what's going on now. You know, that's the time for everyone to weigh in if they have concerns about that. I'm sure when they revisit the, the rate study that process again, um, key on their mind will be some of these issues that, that I've just brought up. Who do we, who do we make our opinions uh, made to on, on that? I know you're, you're a hydrologist, so it's not only your Kuliana, but uh, 
Well, I hate the, the way the rate, rate structure is. It seems to me that it's it's punitive to people who just use a regular amount of water and gives them no impetus to reduce their uh, yes. their consumption. They should you should be able to get your bill almost to zero. Right? Yeah, we go, we go through uh, the you know the uh, required public hearing process when we're doing that kind of rate increases. At that time, that's, you know, that's your opportun opportunity to let your voice be heard. But those are uh, held publicly in some places. Yes, yes. Do you have any <coughs> estimates on what the cost of these all will be relative to current costs? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, you're looking at very low quantities for a very high um, dollar dollar amount per um, thousand gallons. Um, I can't it would be a small <coughs> share and a growing share over time, presumably. Well, we've seen we've seen because of technology um, advances, you know, the, the lowering of what the price is per thousand. Um, yeah, I can't I can't remember I exactly. I remember before the ten as much, but that's not. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm four thinking the price. price. I, I think for some reason um, a number like six or seven dollars sticks in my head, but I don't want to. We try out numbers in front of this group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to transportation, because you have transport so <coughs> But this all is, is, is definitely the, uh, the last reserve that we would like to um, get to. And, um, you know, if we can put it off, if we can, uh, conservation, you can only do so much. Uh, enhance the watershed, um, uh, look at um, the economics of it. Yeah. We can hold it off as long as possible. Um, that's in the best interest of our rapiers. There's not more water to be obtained by drilling. The only place that we are able to, that I feel comfortable drilling in for additional water, would be the Waipahu Alba Aquifer. Everything else, um, you know, and that's why the um, the Pearl Harbor study being done by USGS right now is very um, important to us. It'll identify the the alleys that we can simulate uh, additional drafting and see what the impacts are. Okay, um, just real, real quickly on the desal question. Just the other day I was reading an economic assessment of the territory of Hawaii written in 1954, which claimed that new technologies in desal were right around the corner <laughs> and that uh, it would be economically feasible to desalinate for agricultural purposes. Wow. It, so this question's been with us for a few decades, but is there any new technology on the horizon? There are some countries that completely depend upon desal, obviously. So is, is there yeah. some new technology that you can identify that might make it more economically feasible? Yeah, that's not an area that I've looked into, so I wouldn't be comfortable answering that question. Um, and I would probably refer that to some of our engineers that, that have looked into that question. I'm not an engineer, but I uh, won't shy away from the question. And that is condensation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, plans for deep ocean water air conditioning. And uh, just in the same way that you condense water in your glass of iced tea out of the air, uh, we're going to be looking into the energetics of doing that compared with reverse osmosis. We have optimistic that it may be a lot more efficient than uh, reverse osmosis. By the way, they do reverse osmosis in Bermuda, and there are two sources of water in Bermuda, uh, collection off roofs and reverse osmosis, and that water is 26 cents a gallon to reverse osmosis water. So we don't want a water supply in which we have to pay 26 cents a gallon. Okay, um, any questions for uh, Gary and uh, Rory? No, okay. um, Gary mentioned the water quality plan and Rory mentioned the water resource protection plan, both with a timeline coming out sometime next summer. How closely linked are your efforts? Oh, we never talk at all. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what are some of the kinds of things that are being addressed in those plans? That um, well, on the quality side, which is what the water resource protection plan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
what we're doing, and like I mentioned in the presentation, climate change is one of the things we're going to be really looking at and how that affects the quantity side of the equation. Um, uh, uh, more information on the uh, public trust side of that balance, primarily the TNC and the work that arrives, those kinds of things. Um, other hydrologic uh, uh, issues will be the updating of sustainable yield based upon rainfall, based from John Beluca. He had he came out with a whole bunch of uh, uh, new rainfall estimates. He's also coming out with the ET update, which actually due to us in June. And he's still working to get the draft, the, the draft of us, um, taking those together and how they would change recharges which then would translate into, the, into new sustainable yields statewide. We're hoping to get that done as well. So the availability question on the sustainable yield we hope to have done. That's that's the main point. Thank you. Thank you. My part, it's a, a little early to address the content. We just have the staff on board that we stole from the University of Hawaii for the past month or so, and we're just putting together the you know, the, the, the plan, the plan. Uh, but I know that we're working, our drinking water program is working very closely with the planners and the uh, uh, water uh, commission folks. So uh, maybe more on that in a couple of months. Because, you know, along with the county's um, water use and development plan, that's where all of these things sort of come together. and. Uh, the other part of the landscape that wasn't discussed here today too much was on the demand side, you know, what are we doing about looking at the growth you know, that's driving increased demand and what are those calculations based on and is that another way to manage the situation because there's always been this um, mode of operation in the board of water supply. No, we just provide the water that the county and state land use dis decisions tell us to provide. And so I'm just wondering at what, what point there's going to be more sort of uh, conversation and consultation between all the water managers and the people making the land use decisions to you know, say, hey, yeah, we have this conversation in our back pocket if you keep making these kinds of land use decisions that keep on driving these kinds of growth in our demand for water supply. But if you make different land use decisions, then things would come out differently and having the land use decision makers be more conscious of those trade. As a former member of the city council, I can tell you that at least at the time in the 80s and 90s, I can't address it now, but the the there is a disconnect and a purposeful disconnect between the Board of Water Supply and the land use planning provisions. There are many people in the environmental community who would like to say there's a sustainable uh, population of X and anything above that is too expensive. The reality is uh, where, when the council decides we're going to urbanize something, the Board of Water Supply figures out how to get water there. And the cost of that water is just going to be a cost that everyone bears. And you, you know, you could make the same uh, analysis for how expensive it is to provide public schools or how expensive it is to provide wastewater or electrical resources. And, and the Board of Water Supply does, I don't think, to this day, advocates one way or the other about land use development. And because they're uh, semi-autonomous and need to stay out of that politics, I think it's totally appropriate. Yeah, I think from the, the, the Clifford Jamal period that I'm aware of, um, Policy was always to, to not use water as a leverage uh, for development, and he took that you know hands off step. That went long before. You know, that, that's what I, I remember. Like I wasn't there. We all did. That takes me back to what Steve was talking about with the water quality standards. Because if you look back at the history of the water quality standards, which are admittedly very idealistic, but part of the idealism there was that the water quality standards would help to serve as sort of an indicator and a leverage on you know, inappropriate growth that would cause degradation. There's no such thing as inappropriate growth when your policymakers are judging land use by number of fundraisers they get sold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but we're coming, we're obviously coming up to the limit of our 
Yeah, you're not. Because sure. this sure. island could have be you, like an Manhattan. Have you seen Singapore, <laughs> Singapore, Hong Kong? It's, totally, it's what you want to pay. Your future is what you make of it, okay? You could be Hong Kong, you could be Manhattan, and people will live in almost any sewer on the planet, and they, and they thrive that way. It's a question of what, how you politically foresee what the people demand of their leaders. And right now, people want houses, people want more growth, people want to live in Hawaii. There's a whole world full of people who want to live here. We have yet to find a way to stop them from coming here, including you. Of course, it's not my grandfather. Can I ask a question? Sure. What does gay matter go as tanks? Yes, the trend is that we're, we're depleting our freshwater lands. And we can see that we track the 50% uh, salinity point when we do our logs. And over time, we can see a rise in that point, which tells us that we're losing storage within the lands. Um, so it's a very serious problem. In, um, in some areas, I think Punalu, the, um, the loss uh, of uh, freshwater lands is something on the amount of 100. And, um, oh boy, I'm getting me into numbers that I don't want to. But maybe about 150 feet or so that we've lost at Punalu. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, the, the value of the deep monitor wells are, are um, really important. And um, that is something that we'll probably key on in the future when we're looking into storage estimates. Does that mean that the maximum sustainable yield numbers don't aren't right? Because <laughs> if we have a right to reach maximum sustainable yield, we can be That means that the, the, um, the in all probability, the sustainable yield numbers that are out there will only go down. Well, those are just estimates, right? We don't really know what the maximum sustainable yield is. They, right? they are estimates. Um, uh, so we, it's, it's an but, unknown number, and it's going to be. But you know, they're, they're actually very good because if you as, if you assume that say um, a source uh, co covers a certain capture zone, um, and we look at a particular aquifer, and we look at what our sources are are. Uh, Putting out from that aquifer, and we assume that the coverage is almost complete. Some of those numbers are, are very close to the sustainable yield numbers. So we know that the the estimates that that came out, uh, and that was the product of uh, John Mink, uh, are very good for the time being. Yeah, but but these numbers will only be uh, uh, converged on as we, we get more information. But if anything, the, you know, sustainable yield numbers are, are likely to decrease. But that's a, that's what our lens. That's what the health of our lens is sure. Any other questions? Okay, all right. I think, guys, that was wonderful.